Merci, Madame la Présidente. Thank you, Madam Speaker. I rise today as NDP finance spokesperson. I inform the House that we will be voting for the budget. There are positive initiatives in this budget, ones we have worked hard to see included in the budget. In this budget, there's dental care for students, seniors, those with disabilities. There is a doubling of the GST credit, which is very important in times of inflation. Also in the budget, there is assistance for housing and for groceries. There are requirements for the government to invest in a clean economy, which will also ensure that workers receive their fair share with fair pay and good benefits as well. Now, when a budget is tabled, one can support it or one can oppose it. In the House, we have heard some rather polarizing speeches, controversial ones. Our approach in the NDP is different. These days, polarization, hatred, and anger are more and more present in our politics. We want to find a way to work with everyone, even those with whom we disagree on substantial issues. We need to find common goals. We need to try to make progress rather than decrying and condemning that which is broken or not working. We need to find a way to work through and despite our differences. We need to work together to move forward to help Canadians. Living in times where politics and doing politics is getting more difficult, there's a lot of anger, a lot of justified anger with the difficult circumstances that we're facing and a feeling of unfairness that the burden of those things is not falling equally on the shoulders of all Canadians. People should be angry about that. But it's not enough just to be angry. You have to try and find solutions. And that means trying to bring people together, not just dividing them. So New Democrats are prepared to support this budget as we were prepared to enter in an agreement with the current government not to cause an election in exchange for progress on a number of key policy areas. We see some of those reflected in this budget according to the timeline that had been agreed in that agreement. First and foremost, dental care, a really important initiative that is going to allow millions of Canadians who up to now haven't been able to afford to get their teeth fixed to do that. Children, seniors, people living with disabilities are finally going to get access to dental care that has been eluding them for a long time. And that's had real consequences. It's affected their ability to get and keep a job. It's affected their sense of confidence and socializing with others. It has affected the way that people look at them. It causes them pain. You know, like, these are real things that we are going to help a lot of Canadians take on in their life and find solutions to. We're doubling the GST rebate, not for the first time, but for the second time, because we recognize that in a crisis of affordability, people need to receive help, and that help should be targeted in a way that doesn't simply pour more fuel on the fire of inflation. And this is the best way to do it. Don't take my word for it. Take the word of many private sector economists that, incidentally, are not NDP members and don't always have nice things to say about us but who recognize that this is a way to get help to people who need it and to do it in a way that's responsible in respect uh, of, of uh, inflation. We've also worked hard to ensure that as the government finally, long overdue, prepares to make some serious investment in the new energy economy that is coming, that must come if we're to reduce our emissions and avoid the worst consequences of climate change, that workers stand to benefit from those investments. Not because there's going to be a check handed to corporations, as liberals so often do, and then ask and beg for them to do the right thing, but because it's going to be written in to the funding agreement that they have to pay prevailing union wages with benefits and pension considered in that wage package 
so that we know that Canadian workers, when they show up to work to build the economy of the future, are going to be fairly compensated, and it's not going to get paid out simply in dividends to international shareholders or Canadian shareholders, wealthy shareholders, that hide their money offshore, and we don't see a benefit here. And that's important as we move forward. One of the biggest concerns that workers have had about the changing economy and the changing role of fossil fuels in our economy has been that they get left behind. And initiatives like this are what is necessary to make sure that they are at the centre of that transition and they stand to benefit as much as companies. So those are some of the things that we think are positive about the budget. And I was saying earlier that, you know, there's a lot to be angry about now. We've seen grocery prices go through the roof and it's affecting families. We know that there are record lineups at food banks. We've seen a generation in Canada begin to give up on the dream of home ownership because prices continue to go up and up and up. We see Indigenous people continue to suffer from the legacy of colonialism in so many ways and lose family members and friends regularly, far too regularly, as a result of intergenerational, the intergenerational legacy of uh, colonialism in Canada. And people are starting to see the consequences of climate change and appreciate the enormous cost, both personal and financial, that is coming for all of us if we don't find a way to get on top of it. So yeah, there's a lot to be angry about. I can get pretty angry about some of these things. I appreciate that members here who care about their communities and care about our future get angry about these things. But I say to Canadians, watch out for the guy that is selling anger without any real solutions. Because to be angry and to not try and channel the legitimate anger that people feel about the injustices that are occurring right now in Canada into a real solution is to take us nowhere fast. And when that anger turns in on itself, it's self-destructive and it's why we need to take that anger and focus it on solutions so that we can make real progress. Now, if you want to propose solutions, you have to understand problems. And unfortunately, you don't have to understand a problem to get angry about. And so we see just earlier from the Conservative leader, somebody who's willing to get really angry about problems that he clearly doesn't understand. And if he doesn't understand the problem, it means he's not going to be able to find the solution. What am I talking about? Well, I'm going to go through a list, Madam Speaker. I'm going to go, first of all, to the economy, because the leader of the Conservative Party likes to talk a lot about the economy. And he's right, inflation is hurting people. We agree on that. But if we want to stop inflation hurting people, we have to propose real solutions. And that means we have to understand the problem. He would have you believe that it's only government spending that has caused inflation in Canada. That is not true. It's not true. During the pandemic, we saw across the world manufacturing facilities shut down. We saw shipping shut down. We saw all sorts of supply chain issues as a result of shutdowns due to a once-in-a-lifetime global pandemic. Anyone who understands the market, and it's strange for me, as the democratic socialist in the room, to have to be teaching market principles to my conservative colleague, but anyone who understands the market will know that when you have that level of significant supply chain disruption, you're going to see an increase in prices. That is going to happen. It's unbelievable to me that the economic analysis, so-called, of the leader of the opposition doesn't even take a moment to recognize the fact of the very real supply chain disruption that we've seen as a result of a global pandemic. The other thing that he refuses to mention, just like the governor of, of the Bank of Canada refused to mention for months until we squeezed it out of him at committee, is that corporate greed has been a significant driver of inflation even the governor of the Bank of Canada now has said it, that companies are raising prices beyond the increase in costs that they have occurred, and the inflation that happened because of the global pandemic created circumstances where they felt they could raise their prices and get away with it because people wouldn't know why the prices were going up, and they might think it was justified. And he said that as inflation comes down, we may see prices come down even further as companies no longer have a pretense to be raising their prices. How does the Conservative leader pretend to have answers to inflation when he won't talk about corporate greed? You know who else won't talk about corporate greed? 
the Liberal government. That's something that they have in common. It's a blind spot in their understanding of what's happening to Canadians right now. And they work together to try and silence the voices that would point out the role of corporate greed. I say shame on them both for that. And it's why we have made it a mission here to push the government to do things that they wouldn't otherwise do, including the permanent 1.5% increase in tax on banks and insurance companies that the Conservative leader loves to decry, but never once, never once has expressed support for taxing back some of the money that banks and insurance companies improperly took from Canadians Shame. during the pandemic. Shame. Don't tell me that guy's got solutions. It ain't true. He doesn't even have the decency to recognize a good one when it comes up and slaps him in the face. He likes to talk about housing, rightly so. Canadians are rightly angry about what's happening in the housing market. He likes to pretend that that's a product of the last eight years. In 2004, a house that sold for $30,000 in Winnipeg would sell for $60,000 in 2007, and then well over $120,000 in 2012, Madam Speaker. Housing prices have been doubling in Canada for a long time. They doubled every few years under the last Harper Conservative government. So don't tell me that somehow this is a product just of the last little while. It is a problem and it's a growing problem, but it's been growing for a long time. So how do you solve the problem around housing? Browbeating municipalities into approving building permits for houses that will be built that Canadians can't afford is not a solution. And developers have been building a lot of houses over the last number of years. You know who hasn't been building houses? Governments. Governments have not been building housing. Before 1995, the CMHC, in partnership with provincial governments, would build 15 to 20,000 units of affordable and social housing every year. And they stopped when their funding was cut in 1995 by the then Liberal government. Now, if you take the last 30 years and you multiply the 15 to 20,000 units per year that would have been built, you land right around 500,000 units. Well, you know what the deficit for affordable housing in Canada today is? It's about 500,000 units. How did we end up with this deficit of affordable housing? It's not rocket science. It's because governments like, with the same philosophy as the leader of the official opposition, cut and cut and cut the housing budget right out of the federal government's uh, budget, Madam Speaker. And that's why we have such a dearth of affordable housing today. And that corresponds with the, with the financialization of housing that we've seen not over the last two years or the last eight years, but over the last 30 years. That's when it started taking off because you no longer had more affordable housing being built at the bottom end of the price spectrum which meant all those folks that otherwise would have moved into affordable or social units had to pinch their pennies and make tough decisions about what they could afford and what they couldn't so that they could start to compete in the housing market. And that's how we got to where we are. So no thank you to the leader of the official opposition who runs around saying he's really angry about housing but doesn't even understand where the problem came from, doesn't understand that policies like the ones he is preaching, have caused the housing crisis that we're facing today. It didn't happen overnight, it took 30 years. And unfortunately, it's going to take a long time to fix. It's why we can't afford to have somebody who's so ignorant about how we got here in the first place be in charge, because it's going to push us back another 10 years before we even start addressing the problem. Talk about Indigenous peoples in Canada who have suffered generations of colonial violence, a government determined to commit genocide, to take them, to take children away from their parents, to rob them of their language, to deny them access to their cultural heritage. We're still living out the consequences of that. And the answer isn't going to come without empowering Indigenous people to be masters of their own economic destiny. Obviously, that's important when we talk about developing natural resources. It's important when we talk about the investment of $4 billion here in this budget for a for Indigenous, by Indigenous housing strategy so that Indigenous people have the tools and resources to begin solving the housing crisis for themselves. 
that's important. And you know what? If they can bring private capital and do some of that building in addition to what the government can supply, I think that's a great thing. There are certainly examples of those success, but we shouldn't kid ourselves. Just as we can't rely on the market that has created the housing crisis writ large to solve it without beginning to build again the kinds of affordable uh, housing that we had been building before when times were better in terms of housing affordability, we can't pretend that somehow Indigenous people now are just are going to rely on the market and market mechanisms to be able to house their people. If that was going to work as a strategy, I, I swear to you, Madam Speaker, it would be done already. Indigenous people aren't sitting around waiting for a handout when they have other solutions. What they're waiting around for is a government that is willing to work with them and resource them to be in charge of their own destiny and to be able to, so to, to find the solutions in their own communities. But after they've been economically sabotaged by the Canadian government since Confederation, when they were told, when they started to have successful businesses and then they were told they couldn't take their product off the reserve, there was going to be a pass system and they needed the permission of the Indian agent, well, we shouldn't be surprised that it didn't work out. And now those are some of the problems that we're trying to solve. I know, Madam Speaker, I think you're looking at me in respect of time. Okay. No. Good. So I hope that gives some understanding of the housing problem and what we're going to have to do in order to be able to fix it. I don't doubt a genuine desire to solve the problem, but I really do question whether the Conservative leader and his group have the intellectual wherewithal to be able to solve it, because you, shouldn't, you wouldn't know it by listening to what they have to say about the problem. And it's a similar thing when it comes to the climate. I mean, the fact of the matter is we need to get our emissions down. There's no two ways about it. It has to happen. It has to happen. And so we need to find ways to be able to do it, and we need to find ways of doing it that put workers at the center of that transition so that they have good union jobs that pay well, that provide good benefits, that provide a pension for them when their working life is done to be able to support themselves in retirement and to be able to support their families along the way. That's how we're going to get this done, Madam Speaker. So if we look to the budget, well, how does this begin to assert some solutions? Well, when it comes to Canadians that are making really difficult choices between caring for their teeth and buying their food and paying their rent, a national dental care program to cover children and seniors and people living with disabilities makes a difference. It makes a difference for their dignity. It makes a difference for their health, which otherwise deteriorates until they present in an emergency room because it's gotten so bad. And we pay for it then, but we pay a lot more than what we're going to pay for some preventative de uh, dentist visits, Madam Speaker. And uh, I would say that it's also a question of, of affordability. So for those who are at the margin, who maybe have been able to afford some dental care in the past, but for whom it's been difficult, this takes that cost off their plate and allows them to no longer have to put the care of their teeth in that delicate balance of costs that they're trying to juggle in a time of increasing costs. So the dental piece is very important. Another doubling of the GST rebate <laughs> the Liberals can call it a grocery rebate, they can call it whatever they want. It's a doubling of the GST rebate. It makes sense. It's something that's targeted support uh, that doesn't contribute to inflation because it's not going to households that frankly have the ability, they couldn't cause inflation if they wanted to. They're just trying to buy the same basket of goods that they used to be able to afford that they no longer can afford. That money just helps them be able to make sure that they're putting most of the same things on the table. I talked earlier about some of the investment tax credits and the labor conditions that are attached to those because I think that is really important. It's also really important that Canada begin to, to decarbonize and electrify and we can't do that without producing significantly more power than we currently do and we need a grid infrastructure that can support that power if we're going to electrify not just homes and not just plugging in electric vehicles but industry, aluminum production, steel production. Canada has the capacity to be a world leader and that, that means also opportunity for some folks to make a lot of money at that as well. And so this is an economic opportunity just as it was in the 70s when Peter Lougheed had the, had the vision to make public investments in the oil and gas industry then to benefit 
his, prom uh, his province. And I do want to talk about some of the things that aren't in the budget, but I will leave that for the questions and comments, Madam Speaker.